This monitor is totally blocking my view of you. We're live now? Yes. Sweet. Hey, Norm, we're live. Isn't this amazing? Hi my now. first time doing this, and I'm with JR again. Excellent. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to Crutchfield Live. Uh, first off, we've got people that have been waiting for this show to start. Shout out to Southwest Tech, Hunter Gade, and Jesus Calero. Uh, good afternoon to you all as well. Thank you for tuning in today. I want to cover some very important business right here at the top of the show, and then we'll get to who this guy is. Uh, we are right in the middle, actually close to the end, of a sweepstakes right now. Did you know that, Norm? Yes, I did. We are giving away two $2,000 shopping sprees for Heos products on crutchfield.com. That's awesome. We will have two winners announced at the end of this show. It is not too late to enter. You have about an hour from right now. We will close the sweepstakes in one hour at 5 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, so you need to get entered now. The way to do it is to uh, just Google Crutchfield sweepstakes or there's a link in the comments going out right now. Uh, somebody's doing a link, right? Yes, excellent. Link's going in the comments. Click the link, go there, and sign up. Uh, I have the sweepstakes page here on my screen. This is what you'll see when you get there. This is the HEO sweepstakes landing page. This is where you enter. I'll show you. It's as simple as put in your email address like that. Put in your first name, your last name, and hit uh, agree to all the rules. Make sure you read them, of course. Uh, hit enter. And then, here's where the cool part happens. See that thing at the top that says bonus code word? Right now, in about 10 seconds, I'm going to give you a code word. If you enter it there, you get an additional 25 entries into the sweepstakes, drastically increasing your chances of winning. The code word is WINHEOS. All one word, all lowercase. W-I-N-H-E-O-S, WINHEOS. That's the code word. Enter that, uh, get an additional 25 entries. You probably still have time to share it on Twitter and Instagram and wherever else you can share it to get additional bonus entries into the drawing. Do that now, uh, between now and five o'clock. Get yourself entered into the sweepstakes. We will close those sweepstakes at five o'clock. Somebody behind the scenes will tabulate the results, randomly pick two winners. We will announce those names live on the air at the end of today's show. That's awesome. You're going to be here for that. Absolutely. This is Norm, everybody. <laughs> Welcome to the show. Hello, everybody. Norm, uh, Norm uh, is one of our residential account <laughs> managers. That's your title. I looked it up that, in our employee that's, database. That's accurate. Residential account manager. I feel like that doesn't fully capture what you do. No, but it's a, it's a good segue. What I do is I support nine designers that uh, when somebody – Customer calls in and says, hey, I'm building a new house. I've got, I'm renovating a house, whatever. And they say, I want to put speakers in A, B, C, D rooms, whatever like that. And our regular sales advisors go, that's a little much for me to do. They'll kick it to the AV design group and they'll take care of it. If one of those designers has a question, then they'll kick it to me. And I have almost three decades of actual Ooh. installation, physical installs, stuff like that. Been doing it a long time. And my job is to make my designers support them so that the customer gets exactly what they want. Got it. So now you know what Norm does. <laughs> Norm is here to talk to you. If you have questions for somebody with Norm's expertise, we would love to hear from you about it. And Norm would love to answer your questions. Uh, we think there's probably plenty of questions out there in the world of mounting TVs and projectors and screens. Well, you have a, some experience also, doing that. Also, locations, like a lot of the questions we get uh, fairly often is, where do I put my speakers in my home theater room or my media room? Like, here's my sofa, how do, where, how, where, do I put, where do I put this stuff? And what kind of speakers, like in ceiling and wall, blah, 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 like that. My job is to steer people in the right direction in a way that they go, oh, well, that makes sense. And we're already getting some people saying hello. We got Jim, Bruce, uh, John Dodson. Is that my cousin? I have a cousin named John Dodson. I wonder if that's him watching. <laughs> Ramsey Edward, hello to all you guys. And yes, Bruce, 
Uh, R.I.P. Queen Elizabeth. Did you see that? Yes. Yeah, it's sad. It's all that. Uh, over on Facebook, Robert and Richard. Larry. Richard says hello from Lake Monticello. Vicky says hello. What's up, everybody? Thanks again for tuning in. Uh, and once again, if you have any questions about uh, you know anything home audio, home video, music distribution around your right. house, in wall wiring, in ceiling speakers, any and all of that, we don't know what you want want to know yet. Uh, so send us your questions. We will uh, ask the expert. Let me give you an idea of how expert Norm is, because uh, <laughs> Norm has been in a ton of our YouTube videos, and uh, I just want to show you. Can you switch over to my laptop there, Landon? Thank you so much. Uh, if you go to our YouTube page and search for Norm, that's all you got to type. <laughs> search for Norm. You're going to see some pretty in-depth, very good videos about how to install in-wall speakers, how to install speakers in a drop ceiling panel. Uh, let's see, this is the today. Uh, how to install speakers, uh, how to, an in-wall volume control, how to mount your TV. That's uh, We have already started tapping into the expertise of Norm uh, in our YouTube channel. And uh, so we're just uh, extrapolating on that and doing even more with Norm here today. We thought it'd be kind of cool to be able to answer your questions live. If you don't have questions, I got a page of questions that I'm gonna ask Norm. Uh, but I see some stuff coming in here. Ramsey Edward, we want some discussion about drivers, full range versus crossover ones. Excellent question. And what happens, and I'm assuming this is for a home media situation or stereo at home, you're generally much, much better off uh, getting two drivers, Wolfer, Tweeter, with a crossover because you end up getting a much wider range of response, much wider range of, of frequency response. You generally get better clarity. And the, typically what happens when you have a full range driver, one speaker is doing the, the highs and the lows, they tend to roll off the highs so that you lose some crispness, you lose some clarity. The biggest difference for most people is that they lose the ability to understand the dialogue or the conversation. So if you can, you're much better off getting a speaker with tweeter, woofer, you know, with a crossover to separate which one goes where. Yeah, inside every home speaker. Yes. Right? In those in those bookshelf, floor standing speakers, ceiling mount, they all have a crossover whose yes. job is to send the highs to the tweeter, the lows to the woofer. If there's a mid-range, yes. it sends the mid-range frequencies there. Uh, the, cr the quality of that crossover- Makes a big difference. Huge, huge. It's a big part of why a home speaker sounds good. Yes. Uh, and so that's important. This person, Ramsey, uh, added to that, uh, myths regarding drivers, meaning ferrite magnet size and quality drivers. I think, I'm extrapolating from that. There, I, I've always heard people thought, I used to think, Bigger magnet on a speaker means it's a better speaker. That used to be true, but as more uh, magnet, it sounds like we would say magnet technology, but what they found is that they now have uh, neodymium magnets and there's some other ones, ceramic, stuff like that. It's not the size of the magnet, it's the strength of the field, that how strong the magnet is. And it used to be the bigger the magnet, the uh, uh, more more the field I mean, is true, but now you've got speakers that have much seemingly smaller magnets, but because of the technology, they actually have inside of, especially for a woofer, they'll have a voice coil that can now stay within the entire field, which gives the speaker control better control over the sound. So it's not a given anymore that the size of the magnet makes for a better speaker. Um, we've got some other stuff coming in. I don't know that they're fully formed questions yet. Jesus says, subwoofer, the 14-inch. I don't know. I don't know what you're going to say about that. So, is, for, is this for sub? car or for home? It could be for either, either one. He didn't really tell didn't us. Didn't say, okay. If you want to add, this is a, send us questions. The more detail you can give us, the better answer Norm can give you. Uh, so, send us uh, all your stuff. Uh, C. has said, great explanation, Norm. Thanks. Dan says, what's up, all? Uh, and we've got a shout out from North Carolina from Roger Cobble. Uh, while we're waiting for more questions to come in, because I feel like they are coming <laughs> in, uh, I want to uh, continue. Did we get the question answered about the 14 inch? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Did I interrupt you on so, that? No, I hadn't. You were, what, no, we don't know. That's all they literally said subwoofer, the 14 inch. Gotcha. So <laughs> for home, I'm assuming, it might be car or home. I don't know which way you're going to do it. In a car, a 14 inch. Uh, that's ported is going to give you a lot of boom, a lot of you can feel it in your chest kind of thing. For a home, you, this sounds kind of funny, but you can actually have a 12-inch woofer 
that's positioned in front of you, firing towards you where you can get the impact and you actually feel it in your chest. If you have, a, you can also have a 14, but unless you're spending some serious coin for a 14, typically a lot of the bigger subwoofers that are they're advertising size, not the power, the, when the size goes up, the power requirement to get control goes way up. So a lot of times a 12 inch with tons of power will sound better than a 14 wheel. Yeah, and it's a little bit more easily controlled. More controlled right? and you have more locations you can put the thing. A 14 inch subwoofer in a home is big. Uh, let's see, so the BL value represents the strength of the DR. I'm assuming that's the driver, the BL value. Is that one of the teal small parameters? Could be, couldn't yeah. tell you. You mean you don't know <laughs> what every teal small parameter means? Nope. I'm not in the design part of it. I'm in the, the installation and making it work and blend in well part. Who does need to know what the teal small parameters for, mean? For in a car, if you are building a subwoofer, teal small parameters are very useful in allowing you to uh, design the box to extract the kind of performance you want, whether you want accuracy or if you want boom or slam. The teal small speakers are awesome, very, very useful. But for home, the stuff's already pre-done, you don't have to worry about it. So the, he clarified, BL base level. So the, so the base level value represents the strength of the driver. Is that, are, the, are those technical terms or are general terms? They're general, but the yeah. thing to keep in mind is that, um, again, for home, because most of this is for home, not the, this particular live stream, is that a lot of times the subwoofers are already done. If you're building a subwoofer for a home, uh, definitely spend some time reading it, the, the teal small parameters, stuff like that. Very useful to build a subwoofer. The thing to keep in mind is, is that, a, and a lot of people don't know this, is that uh, people will put ports in their boxes that they make for home, but unless it's a 12 inch or bigger, a, like a 10 inch or an eight inch ported design, has a lot of boom, but not nearly as much accurate. So you can hear a lot of bass, but it's not as clean or clearly defined. I have good news for anybody that wants to know more about <laughs> uh, subwoofer like subwoofer box design, especially as it relates to car audio. Mm -hmm. uh, tune in in two weeks. Uh, we're going to have a show where we talk a lot about that. We're going to have a special guest. Uh, should wow. I say who the special guest is going to be? Sure. <laughs> yeah, why not? Uh, so... Uh, uh, we have a relationship with a guy who has a pretty cool YouTube channel called Car Audio Fabrication. Yeah, I've watched it. Yeah, yeah, Very, he's name, really his, good. His name is Mark, and he's awesome. Uh, there's a reason we are we sponsor some of his videos because they're so good. Uh, that dude builds incredible, high quality subwoofer boxes. He also knows seems to know everything about car stereo installation, and he shares it all on his YouTube video. We've learned a lot from it. We use it in our training class. I reached out to him, and he said yes. So he's going to be on the show in That'd two be weeks. Cool. Uh, so we're pretty excited about that. Oh, just as I was going to ask you one of mine, we've got a question coming in from uh, Darag Kit. Uh, I've got an entry-level Denon AV receiver, a basic subwoofer, and two bookshelf speakers are also entry-level. Should I get a center speaker to upgrade for dialogue or just get a sound bar instead? If, if the subwoofer, or sorry, if the receiver is physically along the same wall as the TV and your left, right speakers, which I'm assuming are on either side of the TV, uh, definitely get the center channel, not the uh, sound bar. And the, because you've got almost everything you need. You just now you need some speaker wire and, and whatever center channel speaker. Things to keep in mind is whatever brand of left, right speaker you've got, whatever it is, try to match the uh, center channel being the same brand. Then that should be the same family, but it should be the same brand. And the reason why that's important is that there's something called voicing, which is, uh, you ever know, you may not know this, but clip speakers tend to have a lot of high end, a lot of crisp clarity. Poke speakers, and, just, and there's no right or wrong, it's just what sounds good to you. Poke speakers are much smoother. So you would never match a clip center with poke left, right. 
or vice versa, you're much better off. God, I cannot get these glasses to stay right. <laughs> it's like, it's like. Those are reading glasses. What are you reading, Norm? Well, I look down at this. Oh, you're looking you're, at that. Right, right. Like, you don't need this. I don't need that. You don't need this. Get rid of it. Get rid of that guy. This distracting. My cheat cheat notes. Okay, so I take them off. There you okay, go. Good. See, less there you distractions. Go. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so, so the what the point I was getting at about the center channel speaker is that the center channel speaker will do a really cool thing for you, is that without the center channel speaker. When somebody's on screen and they're talking, what happens is, is that their voice is coming out of both the left and the right speaker. And if somebody is sitting directly in front of the TV, the voice sounds centered, like their voice is coming from the image on TV and all that. But if the, you got somebody sitting to the right or to the left of you, the more they sit to the right or to the left of you, the more the image or more the sound is coming from that right or left speaker, not from the center. So when you add a center channel speaker now, no matter where you're sitting in the room, standing up, sitting down, left, right, laying on the floor, you, the voice and the, and the, the guy's lips moving or whatever, they always come from the same place. So for your particular thing, because you've already got the, the uh, uh, receiver, you've already got the left, right speakers, all that, you're much better off just buying a center channel. Just make sure it's the same family, same brand as the ones you've already got now. Uh, the questions are indeed coming in. I'm so excited. Uh, Isaac on <laughs> Facebook says, Polk Audio R700 or versus the KEF 950. And if you're unfamiliar or if you can't picture those immediately, I've got them here. I pulled them up on my computer. And so this is the Polk R700 floor standing speaker. Uh, so they're going to go for about $1,700, $1,800 a pair, right? Looks like a big three-way speaker. And we're talking two eight inch long throw woofers, a six and a half inch turbine cone mid range, and a one inch pinnacle ring radiator tweeter. It's a pretty nice Polk speaker. Uh, it's kind of a beast. It's, it's big, it's powerful, it's getting five out of five stars from the 27 customers. It's, it's a nice use. speaker. Comparing that, he wants to know your opinion on that versus this the KEF Q950. Uh, differences being that it's got two eight inch aluminum passive radiators, dual eight inch aluminum woofers, and a one and a half inch vented aluminum dome tweeter with a waveguide. So uh, it's a Kef speaker, a little bit more expensive than the Polk, but certainly in the same ballpark. It's getting similar reviews from customers. Do you have an opinion on it? Have you heard them? I, I've not, I've heard the Polk, I've not heard the Kef. And I like Kef speakers in general, but I've been using the small bookshelf ones and great detail. They have absolutely no bite at all. There's no shrill or anything. The Kef, I don't know about these, you know, how, uh, what they sound, I would imagine they sound the same. It's pretty much a toss up. If I had to choose between the two, I like Poke. I have Poke myself and I like the smoothness and the cleanness of the sound, but it's either way, six, one half dozen to the other. This is a customer review picture of the Kefs, just in case you're wondering. Uh, and I was just looking through the reviews. Uh, they've got 11 five-star and one four-star reviews. People are saying, you know, this person didn't look like the way the cabinets look, but everybody else seems to dig them. These sound amazing. Uh, what else we got here? Uh, they added a subwoofer to it. it seems like people like them. Uh, so great speakers either way. You either way, yeah. You can't go wrong. And with speakers, things like that can be very subjective. Just because Norm might like one or the other better, or I might like one or the other better, doesn't mean you will, which is one of the reasons you get 60 days when you buy stuff from Crutchfield. Good point. To make very sure good you point. actually like it. I got to get to some more questions. Look go at for all it. this coming in. <laughs> uh, I'm going to do an easy one you can answer while I look through the rest of these. Okay. Stephen Holbrook on, uh, uh, Crutch on YouTube says, is there such a thing as too big for a center channel? It depends on how far back you're sitting from it. Um, if you're sitting like 8, 10, 11, 12 feet, you, you, it's pretty tough to get too big. But if you're sitting, uh, you know, six feet away, what happens is, is that you can still have a really big center channel speaker, but you're wasting a lot of its ability. And there, there's no point in spending the money. The other thing about a big center channel speaker is, typically they're fairly tall, and they're fairly deep. So if you're sitting 10, 12 feet back, totally cool to do, but, the, but you gotta remember, ideally, this is ideal, you want the center channel speaker to be, when you're sitting down, you want the center channel speaker to be roughly at your ear level. 
And the reason for doing that is that the way our ears are, are, are made and designed, you know, whoever did it, the, uh, is that it's the easiest for us to understand dialogue, conversation, stuff like that, when the source of the sound is at our ear level. Which, and a great real world example is, is that when you um, are talking to a small child, one of the things you do is you tend to get down on your hands and knees so you're face to face because it's easier to understand them. Same idea, you want the center channel speaker to be roughly at your ear level when you're sitting. It'll make understanding dialogue, conversations a lot easier, but you'll also start hearing more nuances in the background. And a really good example of this is that there was a um, video like 10 years ago, the movie did not do very well, it was Master and Commander of the Far Side of the World. And I had done an upgrade for uh, an installation for a customer and we went to, I don't even remember the speakers now, but uh, but we positioned the speakers correctly. He had them sitting down too low, firing up at him. And he loved this movie. And he put on the DVD and, and, and we were doing it. And he realized we were hearing the creaking of the timbers. There was a shot of inside the boat and they were doing it. But you could hear during the pauses and dialogue, you could hear the timbers creaking that he just never heard before. One, because the uh, speaker wasn't positioned correctly. Two, he got a new speaker better. But the center channel speaker positioned correctly well makes a big difference in how well you can enjoy it. Awesome. I got another good question here. I am ready for it. Uh, <laughs> I had to do some research uh, for you to answer this question. So this is from Sean on Facebook. Can the Klipsch, the fives, be incorporated into a whole house system? Are you familiar with the Klipsch? The, the five, fives? Is that the package deal? Yeah, yeah, so let me show you. I got them here. Uh, if you can pull them up on the screen, that'd be great. We don't technically sell this model of Klipsch speaker any longer, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a discontinued model. It's been replaced by the sixes, okay, uh, which I'll show you here in a second. So the fives are just a pair of stereo? A pair of speakers. Gotcha, okay. Powered. These are powered speakers, right? So they have Bluetooth. They have a built-in DAC. They have a bunch of different inputs on them. Show me a picture of the back I'm of it. I'm about to do that. You awesome. got it. Uh, oops, didn't mean to do that. Here we go. There's the back of these speakers. So we've got analog inputs. They can be phono or line. You can plug a turntable or a regular set of audio analog cables from like a CD player. There's an optical digital in, USB from a computer. It's even got an HDMI, so you can make these your TV speakers if you want to. The question, I'll remind you, can these speakers be incorporated into a whole house system? Before you answer, I think this answer will also apply to the current model speakers that have replaced them, the sixes. They're the same thing, only bigger. Uh, so what's the answer? So here's the deal. When you wanna use a set of powered speakers, like the Klipsch's or something similar, of course you need a surround sound receiver in order to grab the uh, video and audio and the, the receiver passes the video onto the TV and it, it pulls all the audio out. The key is you need a receiver that has preamp outputs. Not inputs, but outputs. And you would feed an RCA cable from the, the left preamp output to one of the power speakers and to the other one. And then you would get a um, non-powered Klipsch center. And for a part of a whole house system, if you're using HEOS or you're using, uh, if, suppose you're using HEOS, which, is, which makes really good uh, uh, whole house sound system, you would use a HEOS uh, whole house surround sound receiver that has preamp outputs. That allows you to have both the whole house ability where on your phone you can say, I wanna listen to blah, 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 and like on the deck or whatever, but you can also incorporate that into the, the surround sound room. But the key is, a surround sound receiver that has preamp outputs or like left, center, right, like that. So it, you could also use them other ways too, right? Like if you wanted to put just a pair of the fives or the sixes in a completely different room from your home theater mm -hmm. and you had like a Heos or a Sonos or Music Cast. Oh, I got you, sound, I got you. Yes, right? yes you could exactly right. You could use something like a Sonos port or mm -hmm. a Heos or link, link, something like uh, that, yes. A Blue Sound node. Yeah. Uh, you could put those right next to your fives or your sixes plug an audio cable from those directly into the back of the powered speakers, Perfect. and now they become a zone of a multi-room music system. Yes, totally So cool. you 100% can, not with just what's built in. No, right? you, you they don't definitely have, need an adapter, because you need 50 signals. 
No, no Wi-Fi built in, no whole, whole, whole music system. Also, uh, I've been corrected by somebody on YouTube. The sixes are not the new replacement to the fives. They are actually older than the fives. Oh. Uh, we have sold out of the fives. We have not yet sold out of the sixes. Ah. And look at that deal on them right now. Uh, the sixes currently, normally 800 bucks, they're 250 bucks off right now. That's pretty good. I, I just looked, uh, we don't have that many left. Less than 100 of each color. So uh, I would say if you want to get those, I have heard them. <laughs> they are awesome. Uh, good deal. You, they sound really, really good. I have listened to these. They sound really good. You might want to act quickly on that. Uh, let's see. What else we've got? John on Facebook says, looking to replace my Marantz SR7005 with either the SR7015 or the Denon X6700. Advantage of one over the other. Do you know those models? Or do you need me to pull well, them Well, I, I can t answer the question in general. Yeah. The uh, Marantz and Denon are actually owned by the same company. And a lot of the stuff's made in the same factories. The difference between Marantz, and they share a lot of common technology. The difference between the two is that Marantz tends to use, uh, what's a good way of saying it, better, higher quality capacitors, which gives you better clarity in your sound. And they also come with a longer warranty. And they tend to have uh, chipsets like the, the DAC, the digital to analog converters, tend to be at least one, usually two or three steps up in their ability to, to like process separate streams and stuff like that. So if, you, if you're already comfortable with the Marantz, I would stay in the Marantz side of it and just step up. Now between the differences between those two models, I don't know. Um, I think that's a pretty good general answer because, and typically the Marantz is known for just being warmer and more musical, but in yes. many other ways, very similar to the Denon. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's sort of, I mean, Marantz has retained what makes Marantz special. Yes. Even though they are owned by the same company, Sound United owns both of them. Uh, and, uh, oh, they also make Heos, by the way. Did I mention Yes, it, Heos? Yes, oh, Heos, Heos, that's right, yeah. Heos, Heos is there's actually... A deal, there's a contest. Heos is in both Denon and Marantz <laughs> receivers. So you can uh, mix and match. Yeah, keep code word win Heos. Is, oh, look, we're all look on the, the same there page you go, here. Hey! Beautifully done. <laughs> Uh, so Daniel on YouTube says, what is the ideal DAC for playing CDs? I happen to know who Daniel is, so I'm going to expand on his Go question a little bit. When, when you see things that have a D to A converter or digital to analog converter, sometimes there's like, they're bragging about which one they put in there, right? Like you might buy a home CD player that has a Wolfson or an ESS Sabre or a right. Burr Brown, things like that. Uh, and I think Daniel's asking, uh, and he specifically said for non-high res. Ah. So if you're just playing Spotify, playing a CD, right? Not high res music, but just regular music. Do you have a recommended DAC? Do you have a preference of one over the other? Uh, and I know that there are people that do, but you may not. I don't. Yeah, I'm not. Simple the, as that. I don't. Uh, the reason why I don't is that uh, most of the time now, if you're buying a good name brand, middle grade or higher, the DAC is already probably rated for high res and it'll do just fine for CD quality stuff. Yeah, that's totally true. Uh, Miguel on Facebook. Miguel on Facebook says, we rarely see speaker designs with asymmetrically arranged drivers. Most manufacturers now arrange them vertically exactly in line, symmetrical. Is there an advantage to this design? Like, I guess, in other words, why don't they put speakers little left, little right, little left, little right? Uh, why are they always straight up and down? Well, actually, there are still speakers made, tower speakers, that made that the, uh, there's usually three ways, where they got the tweeter, and then the mid is to the right, if it's the right speaker, to the left on the left side, and then the woofer down below. But the reason why they're getting away from that is that the sonic advantages are fairly slight compared to the additional manufacturing cost and the technology stuff like that. What they are doing more and more of is that the cabinet that the speakers are in, especially the tower speaker, a fair amount of bookshelves, is that inside they're much more rounded so that the reflections from the backside don't bounce back. And the uh, baffle, which is what all the speakers, like here's the front of the speaker and you take off the grill, there's the woofer and there's the tweeter, is that now the baffle is actually angled a little bit so that the Woofer's coil and the tweeter coil are lined up. So when there's a big explosion, like boom, the sound from both are going out at the same instant. And, uh, uh, and that makes a big difference. I would imagine that from a style standpoint, at one time it made a difference, but I don't know enough, because I'm not a speaker designer 
Uh, I don't know enough about why. I, my thought on it is that a lot of the speakers these days are more slender, right? Yes. They use, they use thinner, smaller drivers, six and a halfs instead of tens and twelves. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, back in my my dad brought speakers home from the Pacific back in the in the sixties, seventies, right? right. Yep. And those were short, fat speakers with a twelve inch woofer and a mid range, it's like a five way yeah, speaker. Right. They were all over the place. You don't see that much anymore. Mm -hmm. Most speakers are taller, thinner. And if you're thinner, there's not really room to put speakers off to the left, to the left or the right. Or the right. Exactly. You're kind of in a straight line. I think point, it's yeah. a lot of the... the it makes sense for the aesthetics. The, the aesthetics. Yeah, they look a little nicer. They're a little bit more palatable. They can blend in with the decor in more rooms, things like that. The, the, the other way of saying it, the spousal approval rating tends to go up a lot the slimmer the speaker is. Totally. Uh, I've got another one here. Uh, Besker on Facebook says, Can a more advanced sealed sub... The, and he is talking home subs. Can a more advanced sealed sub give you a deeper impact than a lower model ported sub? And he's given two examples, SVS uh, SB3000, sealed box, sealed subwoofer mm -hmm. 3000, compared to their technically lower line, right? The PB ported box 2000. So so uh, the, the way that you answer the question is, you, if you tend to watch mostly action adventure movies, you tend to watch... Uh, um, or you tend not to watch as many uh, music concert videos. If you tend to watch more action adventure, just general movies, those like you know Top Gun, Maverick, stuff like that, the uh, you want the ported speaker because you get more impact. You get more of that boom, like when the the jet flies overhead, and you go whoa, okay, that's pretty good. So if you tend to uh, watch a lot of music DVDs. A lot of concerts, stuff like that, like old Led Zeppelin movies and stuff or like that. Or even just listening to music. Or just, just listening to music, yes, perfect. You want a sealed speaker. A sealed speaker's advantage is that it's completely controlled in and out. Again, you still need plenty of power to do it, like 500 watts or something like that. But a sealed speaker is much more accurate. So when someone's playing like an upright bass and they're, they're doing a finger run all the way up or down, you can actually hear the guy's fingers on the fretboard. And it's just cleaner, more accurate. And it's much more musical in that you cover the range. Not as loud, but cleaner and more accurate. I completely concur. More well, power on a sealed enclosure, <laughs> better for music. Ported, you will typically do a great job with with movies. Won't maybe be as accurate and musical as a sealed box. And the key point there is about the ported speaker is if, if it's a like an SVS brand, which I love, it's what I use myself. If you're using SVS and it's a 12 inch ported or a 12 inch sealed, they're both pretty good. And you, you get a little bit more bang, but you still get, because of the way they designed the the, uh, the enclosures and the speakers, they still sound musically, sound pretty good. And the, uh, uh, but if you can go, uh, if you're using a 10 inch and you like music, try to just go with the sealed. You don't get as much bang, but it sounds better. This is the perfect norm question. <laughs> Philip on Facebook says, at what height should in-wall speakers be? Is 48 inches too high? So it's an excellent question. And if it is a, uh, and I get asked this a lot, if it's a dedicated home theater where you're sitting down and you're watching movies, some, sometimes for music, but most time it's, it's just for watching. Remember that earlier I was saying the center channel speaker should be about your ear level? Ideally, the left and right speakers should be at that same ear level can be as much as 12 inches higher, but not definitely not lower. If it's a mixed use, like a media room where you're, you're doing just music and you're, you're also watching movies, stuff like that, a good rule of thumb is still have the center channel speaker at ear level, but put the left right front speakers about 24 inches higher. And the reason for doing that is if you're listening to just the music and you, people are in the background doing other things like you're in the kitchen or whatever, the sound is more at your ear level when you're standing and it makes you reach out and fills out the room for. When you're doing the surround speakers, the speakers that are going behind you and they're in wall, ideally they should be the same height as the front. Fairly often, because of the rear wall, whatever's there, you can't do that because either there's window or something like that. So if you can put them about seven feet up, still firing forward, you're, do, you're doing really well. One question he did not ask but for um, Atmos speakers, which are the speakers that are directly above you, wherever you're sitting, you want one set of speakers that can be ideally directly above you. 
and you want them like that the left right front speakers are 10 feet apart from each other and how you know how far apart to put them if your sofa seating area is about 10 feet however far back your sitting area is which is around 8 10 11 feet you want the left right to be about the same so it forms an equal sided triangle if you're sitting back 12, 13, 14, 15 feet, which happens a lot, you still want the left, right front speakers to still be about 10 feet apart. The reason for doing that is that when the producers and directors are mixing the soundtrack for a movie or even for a CD or DVD, in the mixing studios, the speakers, when they're playing it back and listening to them, guess how far apart they are? 10 feet. And that's, that's kind of a standard. So if you can be, you can be nine feet or 11 feet, but ideally ear level, or within 24 inches. Rear ones, seven feet. If you can, try to do uh, ear level, but higher. And then Atmos speakers directly above you. And it could be 12 inches behind, 12 inches forward, but ideally somewhere in that range right like, there. Like with so many things, it has to do with application. Yes, right. Like very, very much if so. If it's for background music, if it's for direct music listening, if it's for home theater, the answer might not be the same at the same height for each exactly. speaker. Uh, also, there are uh, articles on crutchfield.com, uh, specifically in wall and ceiling speaker placement and installation articles. I bet you had something to do with that at some Just point. Just a little bit. Uh, and there's more. Uh, hopefully somebody's gonna put a link to those in the, uh, in the chats, in the comments. Thank you for doing that. Uh, but yeah, so ton more information there. Uh, Corey asks, and I'm gonna um, tweak this question a little bit. Is down firing home speakers better than front firing home speakers or does it matter? I think we're talking subwoofers Thanks, here. subwoofer, I got you. Right, because uh, down firing speakers that are not subs wouldn't make wouldn't much make sense. sense you know, yeah. That's not really a thing. Down firing subwoofers though is definitely a thing where the driver is on the bottom of the sub facing the floor or a front firing subwoofer with the driver facing out, like directly at you in your couch. What's better, front or down? Ah, so if the subwoofer is gonna be, if you can, this is ideal. If you're only gonna have one subwoofer, ideally try to have it along the same wall as your center speaker, your left, right, and your TV and stuff like that. The reason for doing that is that, remember how James Earl Jones has got this really great deep bass voice? Luke, I am your father. You know, yes. like, uh, yes. my voice deeper than yours? Yeah, I think so. I think <laughs> so part of his voice is actually gonna come out of the subwoofer. So if you have the subwoofer along the same wall as you got the rest of it, it'll all just sound like it's coming from the center channel speaker. If you put it behind you or on the side, it tends to blur a little bit. You can still get away with it, but it's not ideal. So I lost track of what I was answering. So oh, yeah, down first time. Front, front firing, front firing or down firing? What's so, better? So if it's front, if, you, if the speaker's gonna be, the subwoofer's gonna be on the wall or you know, on the same wall, have it front firing. And the reason for doing that is that when there's an explosion or you know whatever, the wave comes directly at you and you can actually feel it in your chest. And it's a pretty big boom, okay, that's cool. The down firing, the reason for doing that is that um, it allows usually, oh, that's a good way of saying it. Down firing allows for much more placement locations in the room. The disadvantage of a down firing is that um, you typically find it in smaller speakers, like comes with a sound bar or something like that is that the, the down firing, the bass hits and goes off in all directions, also bounces off the wall and comes back, stuff like that, and it blurs the bass. So you hear a lot of bass, but you don't get the cleanness or the accuracy or the impact, because a lot of the energy is bounced away from you and then coming at you and it slows it down a little bit. What about the difference in flooring material? I mean, I'm just looking at our floor here. Part of our floor has a, uh, we have a center rug, mm -hmm. and then the outside edges has uh, hardwood floors. So. For if you put a down firing sub over a hardwood floor versus over thick carpeting, I imagine that would change your base. It quite does. A bit. It does mute it a little bit, but surprisingly, it's not as much as people would think. Really, it does does have some impact, but it's not like you'd almost have to A B it to hear and like yeah, I can hear it, but it's not. It's not a big difference. It's noticeable, but it's not huge. Cool. I've got more questions coming in. Uh, let's see here. Do you have a go-to? Oh, do you have a go-to projector? Yes, the, uh, and it depends on, there's, there's two different main kinds of projectors now. The one typically everybody sees is the big one that goes up in the ceiling and, and, and mounts, you know, shoot forward, stuff like that. The other one, which is much becoming much more popular is what they call an ultra short throw. Mm. And literally they can only be, they can be up to like 12 inches away from the screen. 
and the and the the, the there is the, the light goes up and bounces towards you like this. The advantage of an ultra short throw is much simpler installation. Plug it into power, set it up, put the screen in, and a lot, not all, but a lot of short throw projectors have speakers built in. So for quick and dirty, it does a great job. The, um, so in general, like as far as not the style, whether overhead or an ultra short throw, but the technology, the light technology, I prefer laser. They cost more money, but the advantage is the, the colors are clearer and cleaner, the crisper, and the bulbs can last up to 20,000 hours. For typical household, that's like 10 years. Most projectors, whether they're, they're the ultra short throw or the uh, uh, overhead, they have replaceable bulbs that typically you, you're like 2,000 to 4,000 hours. So you, usually during a 10 year lifetime with those, you're typically replacing the bulb at least twice uh, for a total of three, the original plus two. Uh, you end up spending more money for the laser but you get better clarity, you get better reliability, and unlike the bulbs, the regular replaceable bulbs, they tend to fade over time, where at the end of like 2,000 hours, they're not nearly as bright as a laser. Laser stays the same brightness all the way through to the end, or pretty close. So two years ago, we had zero, zero. short throw projectors. It was not a thing at Crutchfield. Oh. It was becoming a thing in the rest of the world, and we wanted to wait a little bit. We have now have 10 different short throw Which projectors. Which is very cool. Uh, and they seem to be quite popular because it's easier to install, yes. easier to get them set up. Yes. Uh, and uh, you have a go-to, did you have a particular short throw that you find yourself recommending more often than others, or, or just Short um, throw is generally like... Gen generally, short throws are generally pretty good. They're one of the things that they keep in mind about short throws, they also have these little tiny pocket-sized ones that are only like 720p, and uh, uh, which is the, the resolution level. And they're good for kids' rooms, stuff like that. But what I... Oh, also for short throw, yeah, I hadn't thought about that, is I want to make sure that the short throw projector can accept a 4K sig... Excuse me. And... Um, it, a lot of the, the uh, more entry-level short throws, they'll use some technology called pixel shifting, where the native is only 1080 resolution, but it actually shifted the, the, just a little over like half a pixel's width. So you get closer to a 4K signal, but you're spending way less money than a true native 4K. So for a lot of people, an Epson or a Hisense, uh, projector, uh, ultra short throw is a really good way of getting crisp, clear images on a relatively pocket-saving, money-saving, you know, way of going about so, it. So uh, I'm looking at our website now, Norm. I'm, I've filtered out all of our projectors, so all we're seeing here is ultra short throw. And based on this, on the resolution, you can either get uh, we have two that are 1080p done right or the other eight of them have 4k via pixel, pixel shift. shifting that's what you want you want the, the 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 4k pixel shifting and because that doesn't take you true to, to all the way up to 4k but it looks way better than a 1080. there so, you go um kc asks on youtube how would you put a sub in the wall without starting a fire so uh, it's a great, question. a great question, and I typically steer people away from doing that because it, it, from an installation standpoint, it's a lot of work. One of the things you got to keep in mind is, is that a subwoofer that's going in a wall typically is people are trying for, they're more concerned about aesthetics than they are about performance. So an in-wall subwoofer can round out the sound, and, but you got to keep in mind, in-wall subwoofers um, they typically, the grill's about like this, about this wide. It's got to fit in between, you know, well, you may not know this, but studs are 16 on center. There's 14 and a half inches of air gap between them. So the sub got to fit in there. The other thing is, is that if it's an interior wall, typically they're only two by fours. So you, you might have only four inches of depth. So you might get a 10 inch speaker in there and you can hear the sound. The other thing is, is that you've got to run speaker wire from wherever that subwoofer location is going to be in wall subwoofer to wherever you're going to put the amp. And, the, and you've That's, got to have an amp. I think we're getting to the crux of the question here, right? right? Yes. You can't just take a 
regular powered sub, which has a woofer and an amp in a box and put it in your wall. That's not how Actually, it works. Actually, it's not designed to do that, but you can do that. Oh, yeah, correct. I mean, you can. You can't right? put it here. No, there's no law saying you can't, uh, other than uh, it's like against building codes and stuff like that. Uh, actually, you gonna th there is there is an answer to that, and the, uh, I mean you could build like uh, an opening in your wall and set it in there. And what you use is you know how you got the return air grant or bent yeah. grills. Yeah. So you build an enclosure inside. You set the subwoofer inside there. Ah. Put the grill on top, and but you got to remember you've got to have power there, and you have to then get a source of signal either wirelessly or wired. So the other drawback to it is this: is that the subwoofer has to be front firing mm -hmm. because it's got to fire straight out. And if it's ported, the port's also gonna be on the front firing straight out. You don't want a down firing. You don't want the port in the rear because it'll just sound boomy. The I've done this four or five times and it was designed to, the, the one part of the spouse wanted the performance. The other half of the spouse or the, the couple wanted, didn't want to see it. So we came up with this. We actually built an enclosure on the back side that just set the subwoofer in there. So it's kind of in the wall because you can't see right, it once it it's installed, right. but you've actually built a wall box. Wall box, correct. That you have power in and the sub needs to be front firing. Right, front firing. We yes. also sell in-wall subs that are actually designed to literally be installed inside the wall. Yes. And the key difference here is that those don't have amplifiers in the enclosure. Yes, you don't need to run power to them, but you got to run the speaker wire to them. And speaker wire gets run in the wall all the time. You've done right, a video yes. about how to do that, yes. right? So that you're just running speaker wire from an external amp that's probably mounted somewhere near your home theater receiver. Yes, I typically do not recommend people putting powered subwoofers in the wall unless they're pretty comfortable fabricating. Because one of the things you have to do is you have to build a platform to raise the subwoofer up because you've got the baseboard and the subwoofer's got to be higher than the baseboard. You're gonna need a really good drywall person. You to, need a, to you get need this a drywall done. person like that. So it, it's, <laughs> I would strongly recommend that. I, I'm very discouraging people trying to put a powered subwoofer in a wall. Definitely doable. I've done it, but it's not something for the typical homeowner. Uh, this is a question that might be best answered by someone off camera. Now, this question's come up on more than one Crutchfield Live, Philip. Uh, are the soundproof acoustic? Are those soundproof acoustic dampeners on the wall behind you guys? People are always curious about what these panels are behind us here. And uh, Philip, our video producer guy, uh, is the one who ordered these. Um, what are they, and why are they there, and what? Tell us about them. So those are combo. I can probably grab one actually. Ooh, oh, you're getting the close-up view here. These Whoa. are combo uh, absorbers and diffusers. So there's absorption material in here. I think they're two inches thick. But then this is sort of a diffuser design. So typically you're trying to get rid of reflections and unwanted sound waves either by absorbing them or scattering them. These are kind of combo. They do both. They also sort of look like an interesting design. This is a video set. That's why we have them. <laughs> to the left, right, and straight above, we have absorption material just to, to pick up any um, frequency. We got absorption material coming in. <laughs> so these are just big, large uh, alpha sorb is the, is the type of panels from Acoustical Solutions. We sell these and other uh, 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 acoustical um, items from them, but this is a big absorption panel. They do a great job in a studio environment or a set. While I'm here, I don't want to hijack the show, but I saw another question <laughs> yeah. that I wanted to answer just because I love it and I have it at home. It was a question from, I think, Dean something on YouTube. He's asking about the Blue Sound node and an external DAC. Um, oh, yeah. I use the Blue Sound node at home. I use it as like the digital side of my system and I, I like it a lot. I use it as a DAC and everything. And I think for the price and for the size and for the features, it's really, really good. But he's talking about a pretty high end, it's a multi-bit balanced DAC from a company called Shit Audio that we don't carry. Um, what did you just say? That's how you pronounce it. <laughs> That's right. how you pronounce it. it. Shit okay. Audio. Um, but it's a, it's a good external DAC. In a case like that, he asked about USB versus optical. The Blue Sound node, has a USB in USB input for like a mass storage device. It's not a USB output, so you'd use the optical output from the Blue Sound node into your external DAC. Uh, and he asked about resolution too. It de might depend on which version of the Blue Sound node, but the current one is like 32-bit 384K. 
Um, the optical out, I'm not sure would support that. I don't know. I don't think. And I was would. looking at the details real quick to see what the optical out supported, if it was just PCM or, or how far it went. Um, pretty, pretty likely that the, the optical question. out is PCM only, which is like 48. You, you would be losing the advantage you're trying to gain. I don't know that, but you probably would for high res. That said, it's a great streamer depending on right, the right, streaming yeah. service you're trying to bring in. Certainly, that external DAC would be an upgrade as a digital to analog converter in that case, and you get balanced um, mm -hmm. depending on what your your next device is in the chain. So anyway, yeah, that's worth researching. Dean mentioned the uh, the sh the shit yigs drizzle. I don't I know wasn't if I'm saying try that right. The second half. <laughs> I, I, went, I went for it. I went for it. I'm not afraid. Uh, th there's another question here. How do you add HEOS to a beloved two-channel system? You want to do this one? I'll do it. We don't need Norm for this question. I got uh, it. It's got it. Uh, let's see here. We've got a lot of HEOS products, powered speakers, sound bars, subwoofers, home theater receivers. One of the things you can get from HEOS is called the HEOS Link. Link. And uh, it is on my screen now. It'll be on your screen shortly. Uh, as soon as we get it switched over, there we go. It's the HEOS link, and uh, it is simply a zone of your HEOS multi-room music system. Uh, it doesn't have any speakers, doesn't have any amplifier built in. All it has on the back are audio outputs that you can connect to your beloved two-channel audio system. As long as you have a set of analog RCA inputs mm -hmm. or an optical digital or a coaxial digital input on your system, you connect this HEOS link to your system and now you've turned any system, even if it's 50 years, years old, old makes no difference. as long as it has those inputs on it, uh, you can pipe in whatever you're streaming on your HEOS system and it becomes a zone and it's pretty great. Um, so it seems like these acoustic panels have come up a couple times. I've seen we've put links into the, the comments here on YouTube uh, for people to check mm -hmm. out the acoustic panels we sell. I want to just ask you, uh, is this a thing that you find yourself recommending? I mean, you're doing resident, you're the, you're the residential <laughs> account design, whatever. Uh, do, do you sell acoustic panels? So typically I don't, normally in my day in day out job supporting the designers, um, I very like I've only in the last year, I might have had two times I've had questions about the panels because typically that involves someone who is trying to tweak the system and they're trying to get rid of a problem. And usually, uh, uh, but that doesn't occur until everything's all set up and they've been using it for a while. And sometimes they'll call back in, but most of the time the designer will, will take care of or even a regular sales advisor. So, so the, some, the panels can make a big difference. Like you can't see it, but right now we have a, another uh, sound absorbing panel on the back side of the microphone in order to make sure that my voice sounds clear and clean in JR's and we're not getting the reflection back which tends to blur the sound. Cool. Cool. I'm, I'm looking through these questions. We got a bunch more. Uh, I, before I get to them, I want to make it. I want to. I want to do last call for Heos. <laughs> yes, do that. Uh, it is 4:52. We have eight minutes left until the sweepstakes close and shut off, and you can't enter anymore. Use the code word. It's on your screen now. Win Heos, all one word, all lowercase. Just go to Crutchfield Sweepstakes. Links are in the comments in the chats. Uh, enter the sweepstakes. The prize is uh, you can win one of two $2,000 shopping sprees for Heos products on Crutchfield.com. We are going to announce the winners after uh, 5 o'clock. We'll close it. We'll figure out who the winners are, and we'll announce them here live on this show. Uh, while we're waiting for that, let's see if, how many of these we can do before we uh, run out of time here. Robert on Facebook says, Question. Given that home and car audio are two separate beasts, are there manufacturers that still make a home sub with speaker inputs and outputs with a high or low pass crossover to sync whatever speakers in line with the sub? This yes. This was more of a thing when I started in 96, we had more subs that where people would hook them up this way. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, what, out of your, say, a stereo receiver, you might go speaker wire to your powered sub, mm -hmm. and then out of your powered sub to your speakers, mm -hmm. so that the powered sub could grab the bass, mm -hmm. low pass crossover, it amplifies the, the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the deep bass sounds, and it allows the rest of the sound to go onto your speakers. Mm -hmm. Is this still a thing? It's still a thing. And uh, um, what's been interesting is people, uh, album sales, just regular vinyl, is the fastest growing music category sale outside of streaming because everybody's doing that, but of, of physical media. 
And one of the things that's happening is, is there's been more and more people uh, buying or starting to use their old equipment, but want more kick. So we, if on, you want to show them filters and how you could filter for uh, subwoofers that have that. That's a good call. I probably should have done that while you were talking. Uh, but I was <laughs> He's thinking, new at this. He, you he'll keep catch talking. on. I'll, right? have it here, I'll have it here shortly. I'm look, uh, maybe here now. I'm at Powered Subs. Got a ton of them. We sell 157 Powered Subs. How many of them have speaker level inputs? Is this a filter? I'm testing you here. To Should see be under if, general. Sure, sure enough, it is. Under general features, speaker level inputs and speaker level outputs. You need to filter for both. You can probably just speaker. Speak, you can probably just filter for speaker level outputs, and I'm guessing that all eight of those have both. Right. So yeah. what's interesting is is that we sell 140 some subwoofers. What's really interesting is only. 25% have any kind of speaker inputs or outputs, and of the ones that have outputs, it's only eight. Yeah. So it's not a whole lot that has it. If, then this is where you, you, when I'm listening to somebody and what they're trying to do, I'll ask them where they're gonna physically put the subwoofer. If it's gonna be, ideally, it should be along the same wall as the receiver and where their left, right speakers are. And ideally, if you can, try to put the subwoofer somewhere between the left right speakers one of the things that's interesting is is that if you have a powered subwoofer and this is for home theater or for stereo and you have the subwoofer in a corner whether like the right front or the left front you get the most bass output but it's the least accurate if you take the exact same subwoofer you don't unhook anything and you just slide it along the wall so it's still up against the wall the bass output drops some but it becomes more accurate if you bring the same subwoofer that's now centered in, but you bring it more out into the room, like 25, 30 inches away from the wall, then the bass is the most accurate, but the least loud. So there's, there's no right or wrong. A lot of people will put it in a corner because they want to hear the boom. But if you tend to be more music oriented, you'll slide it along, try it, or even may bring it out a little bit. And there's no right or wrong. It's just what sounds good to your ear. You know how, uh, if you're doing a stereo and you have your left right speakers, they're 10 feet apart from each other One of the things that you'll read a lot about is they, they'll say tow them in which all that means is to have the tweeter aimed directly at wherever you're sitting and Ideally you want to be roughly about 10 feet from the speaker So it's 10 feet left to right 10 feet from here to here and back to the other speaker and if you can have the subwoofer somewhere in between that'll give you the most accurate sound and the uh, I, the other thing is, is that if you get a subwoofer for music, this is for stereo, try to get one that's sealed with no port. That'll give you the most accurate sound. Cool. We have a, another question about subs. This one should be a quick one. Do you sell bass traps? That's another type of acoustic treatment that yeah. will, you know, a lot of bass will gather in the corner of your room mm -hmm. uh, and it'll muddy up your bass. And if you have a bass trap, it sort of cleans up the sound a little yes. bit. Uh, do we placement, sell bass traps? Placement is critical. And it's a, um, if you're a type A personality where you got to get stuff done, I need it done now, you're not the person. If you, you want to hire somebody or get somebody that's comfortable playing, listening, move it, play it, listening, move it, totally cool to do. But it's not a simple bass traps, sound treatment, stuff like that, are not a one solution. It it literally you, you sit down, take your time, do it, and it's a tube. Um, I haven't seen that in a while. Let's see. These are those. These are the Alpha Sword panels. Basically, what we right. brought out earlier. We should have a bass trap in there. Uh, I don't see it listed as an accessory here. Let me dive a little deeper and go to acoustic panels and treatments and see if any of these look like bass traps. I have one of those. The Ortelec Subdued is great. They're put awesome. It, put it under your subwoofer and your windows will stop rattling. That's what happened in my house. None of these. We used to carry them. Like bass um, traps. And we might not. Uh, so I'd say the no, answer is no right no, now. No, yeah. Uh, so par apologize for that. The answer is no. Shout out from David says, I'm 44 now, been shopping your catalog since 92. When people come to my house, it's like they are listening to music for the first time. I love that feeling. That's awesome. Heck yeah. Uh, also on Facebook, John asks, can you talk about ARC versus eARC? Basically, how to set up the TV and receiver to use it. Uh, audio return channel versus enhanced audio return channel. The setup is basically the same. Yes. Uh, what 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 do people need to know about that? So, e in order to use eARC, you've got to have 
both the TV's got to have a, say eARC, and on the back of most TVs, it'll have two, three, four HDMI inputs, but only one of them will be labeled eARC or just ARC. But the receiver also has to say eARC. Both have to have them there in order to take advantage of it. If one's got another, it'll still work just fine, but you're not taking advantage of the enhanced audio return channel. And the, that's what the E stands for is enhanced. And the advantages is that it allows you to do uh, at most the object sound where you can actually hear sounds over your head, left, right. There's a lot of advantages to doing it, but you got to have both the receiver and the TV. A lot of, well, what happens a lot of times is people will have the TV, it's a new TV, the receiver's not new enough to have it. And it's not, a receiver cannot be firmware updated because it just, physically the hardware just isn't there. So you need to, I mean, for the most part, it's incredibly simple. It's very simple, just literally plug and play. It's li li because of HDMI with CEC, or Consumer Electronics Control, that's a part of what makes ARC work so well. Mm -hmm. uh, you plug it into the right input on your TV, the right input on, say, your home theater receiver, mm -hmm. and your TV will just recognize that you've done that. And you might need to go into the settings to tweak a thing or two, but probably won't even have to do that. It's you, sometimes you got to tweak it, but a lot of times it's just basically plug and play. But yeah. not always. <laughs> oh my gosh! Don't let the tech support department right. hear so, you so say so that. Plug and play. No. Yeah, I, I, I <laughs> sorry. Uh, no, that's great. Uh, Bruce on YouTube says, "Is it better to have subwoofers facing you from the front or placed behind the viewer or listener, like behind a sofa, with the sub pushing base into the sofa?" So it depends. Uh, I personally much prefer, by a big margin, having the subwoofer in front of me firing toward me because the wave comes directly at me and you get more kick. You get more of the real world, you know, feel it in your body. You can hear bass really well, but it, there's a, another whole jump in enjoyment in the movie if you can also feel it hitting in your chest. So front firing directly at you, the wave, awesome. If you're going to add a second subwoofer, one of the things that's really cool is to take and have, um, say you've got the front subwoofer in the, like the walls 10 feet in the right corner of the wall, have the second subwoofer behind you on the diagonal wall, so it's on the rear wall, but to the left. That will not give you more bass in the sense of like loud or anything like that, but it spreads it much more evenly throughout the room so that you end up getting much like if you're sitting in the sweet spot or you're sitting to the left or to the right or the next row behind you, everybody can enjoy more of the bass and the kick and stuff like that. But ideally, if you only have one subwoofer, front wall firing directly towards you. That That's usually the, the it's a good, very safe way of starting. Hunter on YouTube, uh, I'm going to simplify his first question. Uh, he's asking about... Uh, if you have an opening in a room where a side surround would go, is it okay to equally move both sides forward or back? So the surround side speakers, do they need to be right there equal to your listening position or can you move them forward or back to fix a problem with your room, like a door or a window being in the way? So it's tricky. And, uh, and here's the g generic general answer is that ideally, and, and it sounds like you're in a situation where you can do one correctly and the other one you can't. Ideally, they should be lined up with your ears. So like if you looked immediately to this or that, you're looking directly at the speakers. And they should be up about six feet or so off the ground if it's a mixed use room, which most of them are. Um, but if you can't do that, at least have one done accurately. And this, this, is, this is not the answer, it's just one of the couple ways of doing it and have the other one move forward or backwards. What happens is, is that, um, remember in Indiana Jones, the one that had Sean Connery as Indy's father? Yeah, there's the third a, one. Third, yeah. yeah, there's a scene in there where they're getting chased by the biplane and, and the, the Indy runs off the road and, and his father says, nice driving, Junior. And the plane is circling around. And what happens is you can hear, say this speaker's mounted correctly and this one's forward or back. The sound sounds right coming around the room. You hear the plane going around, but then it'll sound like it jumps a little bit, and the uh, uh, because you got a bigger gap between the rear speaker and the front on the side. So, in as much as possible, you try to get them lined up. And if you've got a choice where you can take the speaker higher to get them lined up, try that. 
and just aim the tweeter down. Hunter also asks, have you heard of an acoustically transparent drop-down screen, you know, for a projector? I have limited space, and that would be cool. Yes, the, they do make them. They're expensive, and, uh, but they do make them. And uh, um, if it's going to be a drop-down drop screen that's acoustically transparent, a uh, very cool thing to do. One of the things, and this is a little geeky, little techy, most screens, when they, they roll off the roller, they roll off, off the back of the roller closer to the wall. If you've got equipment and stuff like that, and you want the screen to be in front of the speakers, ask for what they call a reverse roll, which is where the, the screen comes off the front of the roll and comes down, and it'll give you more air gap front to rear. And, the, and this usually works pretty well. It's a custom order, but it can make the difference between having to move the entire uh, mounting further out into the room to get it to work right. So usually call uh, one of the AV advisors and, uh, and we can step you through it for shorten it. And we can actually do it real time on your, uh, we can show you and step you through on the screen how you do it. Yeah, we have a ton of screens to choose from. Yes. I'm curious, I don't know the we answer. We have over 8,000 screens. We have we have acoustically transparent screens ready to go that we stock yeah. or drop ship. Uh, do any of those front roll or are they all back It's a roll? custom order. It's not, so it's, you it's, can't just buy one off the shelf, basically. Off the no, shelf. It, 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 we have them available, but it's a custom order and it takes, I don't know what the... Turn, I don't. I can't tell you the, the lead time now. Yeah, the custom ordering of the screen. But it's very, and it ships directly to you. It's drop shipped. Yeah, not cheap though, are they? Nope, not, not at cheap. all. Uh, but very, see. very cool, but not cheap. <laughs> all right, awesome. Thank you for answering both questions. That's from Hunter. He's still watching. Awesome. Thank you, Hunter. Uh, who see who we got here? Chris D. Been a customer of Crutchfield since the '90s. Awesome. Have a question. When the TV and audio are out of sync, how can that be fixed? As you can imagine, it's extremely frustrating. Thanks in advance. Yes. So um, there's two ways of doing it. Most TVs and most receivers have something called audio delay, and it goes from like zero to 100 milliseconds to 250 milliseconds and you can um, f adjust the delay to get the voice synced back up with the audio, or sorry, with the video. What happens is, is that probably 95% of the time, that's all it takes to do it. However, sometimes on some streaming services, Netflix used to do it a lot, but they've, they've, they've long since taken care of it. Uh, HBO still happens every once in a while, and on Discover, it happens every once in a while, What'll happen is, is that movie streams fine, another movie starts, and then the, the, it's out of sync. So you've either, the, either got to stop, start the movie again, and usually it'll take care of it, or you got to go into the TV settings, audio settings, and get it synced back up. And it's annoying. Uh, it's much better than it used to be, but it's not. I was going to say, I haven't experienced this in a long, long time. time. Right. But it does happen. But. The other thing that, that can make a difference is if your internet speeds, this is when you're streaming, if your internet speeds are fairly low, like 25 megabytes a second or something like that, which is the recommended minimum for watching a 4K movie, what happens is, is that it, for some reason, and I don't know exactly why, but it happens a little more often. If you got like 100 megabytes, like I have 600 megabytes, it, I haven't had that happen and I can't tell you. Hey, you're going to be impressed. I have... 20 megabits of download speed. Oh, dude, you and rock! I never have lip sync <laughs> audio video sync issues. So uh, I still have DSL. I live out in the country. So. Gotcha. Uh, Steven on Facebook says, I have an original pair of Boston Acoustics A150 speakers in need of new woofers because the foam surrounds mm -hmm. dissolved over time. Boston Acoustics has been sold to another company and no longer sells the original replacement woofers. Where can I find suitable replacements? Let's apply this question to the general idea of can you replace the woofer in home speakers? Uh, if the manufacturer makes one, obviously you can, right? You want to use your roll and keep going. That's pretty rare. Like <laughs> for some speakers, uh, we've had them for Infinities and Polks over mm -hmm. the years. I think I remember us having them from Boston Acoustics at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, but not really, that's not a common thing. We're not in the business of selling replacement drivers. We have them for people that need them. Uh, if the manufacturer doesn't make one or isn't available anymore, uh, I think that's do you, do you that's, have solutions. That's the question I'm there asking is, you. What there would you is recommend? A couple of guys, and these are guys. These are not companies. These are just guys that like doing this. They sell refoaming kits, or resurround kits, or, or the foam surround kits. And 
they're depending on which company you got, and you have to do a Google search for it. Uh, you can either send the speakers to them, and they'll just the driver, not the entire speaker, just the driver, and they'll re uh, phone, put the new surrounds in, and send it back to you. Or they can send you the kit. The key is it is technique dependent on how well the job lasts. So if you're not techy, you're not oriented, and stuff like that, let, let them take care of it. Yeah. But but there are there are a couple of guys. I've had good results from one. He's in. This is a couple of years ago, uh, Missouri. I think that my customer told me that it took him about six eight weeks, but th they've been more confined. So this is one guy that told me. So I, we don't recommend him. We don't know anything about him. But it's just there are people out there that like doing it. Uh, I see three more questions that we've got already in the system, and they're they're pretty going to be fairly quick answers for these. Uh, uh, I know G. I think that's how you say it. Uh, do you prefer a belt-driven turntable or a direct-drive turntable? I prefer a belt drive myself, and the uh, because it's better, more it soaks up more vibration. Uh, disadvantage is is that over time the the belt needs to be replaced, but the technology's gotten so it lasts a pretty long time. The technology in general for direct drive and the belt drive, they both have gotten really good. So it's unless you're getting really nuanced, it's sort of hard to go wrong either way. But just personal preference, I like belt drive. Tyrone on Facebook says, can one get an entire basic system for under $1,500? Are you talking stereo or surround sound? Yeah, we don't know. If you're still watching Tyrone, uh, feel free to tell us more about what you want your basic system to have. Uh, if you're looking to get a TV as part of that, that's going to push your budget a little bit. Uh, if you're just looking for an audio system, a two-channel system, turntable, CD player, tape deck, and we, you can do all of that, and a pair of speakers, maybe even a sub, the answer is yes. I mean, we can get you a basic system. That sounds pretty good. We don't know yet what all you need your basic system to do. If you can tell us that, we can maybe answer your question even better. Also, this show is going to be over in a few minutes. Uh, we may not get a chance to answer your question. However, you can just call an advisor. I trained them all. I'm one of the people that trained them all. I trained him. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, isn't that funny? Yeah, it's, it's true. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You were uh, actually one. I think I was your first person you actually trained. Uh, you, you're or close. close it's pretty close. I, I, yeah. yeah. I had just finished my first training class, and then you came back to Crutchfield. Crutchfield. You yes, used I'm to work a, I'm a retread. He left for a little while, a long while, and then came back to Crutchfield, and that's when I trained him. Uh, <laughs> I learned more from him <laughs> training him than he learned from me, I can guarantee it. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, all of our advisors have been through a pretty rigorous training. They can certainly hook you up with a system uh, that will probably suit your needs uh, for, a re for it within your budget. They can definitely do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, whether it does everything you want or you have to make compromises, I can't tell you until I know more. Uh, we're close to the end here. Philip says, finishing my basement and ran 14-2 wire for home theater. Okay. 14 gauge to conductor. Plan on 5.2.4, so five speakers surrounding, two subs, four Atmos speakers. Thinking Polk in-wall speakers with golden ear subs. And I'm now realizing that's not a question. That was it. That's what he that's said. How does perfect. that sound? Does that sound like that's a good awesome. system? Yes. One of the things to keep in mind is that location of the speaker in relation to where you're sitting has a huge impact on the quality of the sound you get. So when you're designing the system, one of the first things you wanna do is make sure you know where you're gonna sit. Because everything from that location determines your viewing distance, the height of the speaker, the locations of the speakers around you, all the stuff like that. It, it, but make sure you dial, uh, know pretty much where you're gonna sit. If you have a significant other that likes rearranging the room from time to time, like push the sofa back, whatever like that, take the rear surrounds and push them back another two or three feet so you've got some leeway in order to uh, um, allow for the furniture to be moved. Every time you move furniture, rerun the sound microphone test to get the speakers re-equalized to the new uh, sitting position. Tell me the truth. Are you the significant other that moves the furniture around a lot? No! <laughs> Not at all! <laughs> uh, it's done. It's good. Leave it alone. <laughs> Chris D on YouTube says, thanks guys for the great info. One last question. Back in the day, Denon made some of the hottest receivers. I still have one, but the model is escaping me. That said, are they still just as good? Yes. 
Very, very much so. One of the things that's happened though, and this is just in general, this is across the industry, is that until you get up to the high end, higher end Moran stuff like that, is that there's so much more technology mounted in the equipment. Atmos technology, certain surround sound in general, uh, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi capability, stuff like that, is that in order to get all the stuff in there and to pay all the fees and licensing fee to do that, the thing that has taken uh, a step back has been the quality of the power supply. And the power supply has gotten smaller in order to stay within certain price points, stuff like that. So typically, if your receiver is, uh, I don't know which one you've got, say it's 100 watts per channel. He whatever. doesn't know which one he's, he's got. got. Right, so you want to stay, go up, then and still makes great stuff. and But you probably want to stay step up to the Marantz in order to get the same performance as what you've got right now. Uh, if you want to look for that, you still get all the other modern stuff. And the um, Denon works really well. If you didn't know, you probably wouldn't miss it. But I like Marantz. I do a lot with Marantz. Uh, Gregory said, uh, in going back a few questions uh, regarding the replacing of the foam surround mm -hmm. on speakers, uh, I had this refoaming done on my towers, and they work great. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, but he had it done. He, well, you had he, it, didn't, right, do it, he right. didn't do it himself. He noticed, you had it done, yes. Because yes. it is the the success of the the the, the, the surrounds. It's definitely technique uh, uh, based in order to get good performance out of it. Yeah. it's not something you just take out of the box and open. It doesn't work that way. And those of you in the background looking at comments, have I missed any questions that need to be answered? There's a bunch going on here. I think I got them all though, right? Nice job. Thank you very much. How close are we to having the names of the Helios uh, sweepstakes? Hopefully in the next few. In the next, we don't have them yet. Not yet. All right, cool. I'm gonna ask you questions now sure, then. Sure, go ahead. Uh, so let's, uh, let's fill in everybody on, we mentioned you were a retread. Mm -hmm. uh, you worked at Crutchfield, then you left Crutchfield, then you came back to Crutchfield. What did you do when you were not at Crutchfield? So um, I like installing equipment. I like things, it's my friends and family, they would say, hey, can you help me do X, Y, Z? And I, I don't know why people think I have, what is it, you know, an installer's face? I have no idea. Did you go to stereo installation school? Nope, never no. did anything like that at all. And uh, I mean, I've been trained a lot, but I've never went to a school. And I like things that work well that are elegant, that are simple, that you don't have to call in your five-year-old to explain how you how to use it. And, uh, well, you laugh, but... <laughs> no, I, I know, I get it. <laughs> you know, so, uh, so what, I was here in the 70s, is that right? No, early, wow, it's been so long, I don't remember. So I was here, I think in the early 80s, and uh, got married, and my wife, we bought a house in Richmond, which is about... 80 minutes from where Charlottesville is here. But I kept commuting back, because that time was all, you had to be here present doing it. And she kept going, no, no, I'm like, okay. So I went to work for Circuit City. Ooh. And they uh, huge change. Was that, back then, Crutchfield and Circuit City were direct competitors. These days, not so much. Not so much, right? yeah, because Circuit City. Did you gone. feel like you were going to the enemy back then? Oh yeah, very much so. <laughs> oh, very, very much so. It, uh, it, but what was interesting was, in about six months, I, I discovered that people would come into the store and they were like, this is when VCRs were really popular. And they got the SVHS and hooking it up and this yellow cable, what do I do with this? And you know, blah, blah, blah. So customers would pay me $25 to go out to their house, plug it in, show them how to do it. And I was leaving one day and this old German couple, the the, the he was a little scary, the guy. And he, he grabbed my arm, he shook my hand, but he wouldn't let go. And he said, you should do this for a living. I said, well, I do do this for a living. He said, no, no, you should do this. And I went, installation? He says, yes. And I went, light bulb. Hmm. So before you left Circuit City, though, you were... Was I was this, already starting my own company. Was this a service Circuit City offer? No, no, no. Or were you poaching a, their in customers and doing installs on the no, side? No, other salespeople would come up to me and go, hey, they, so circuits like your managers were okay with this oh, happening? Oh, totally okay because it made customers happy. So this was like the original, like this was Geek Squad before Geek there squad was a Geek, Geek squad. squad. Yeah. Right? And the, uh, so what ended up, I ended up doing was I took and uh, printed up business cards and, and I named the company Hookups of Virginia. And, they, uh, and I actually had at one time 
my phone number was 1-800-HOOKUPS. And uh, through- This through, didn't cause any problems it, at no, all, did it? it no, it, it took me a little while. I was a little naive, but I had 1-800-HOOKUPS. And um, y'all are laughing, but it gets, this is with the MCI. And, uh, and I was paying 25 cents a minute for the call coming in. And, oh my gosh, and invariably, <laughs> invariably, because my company, I just said hookups, not of Tennessee, not of anything. Keep saying it, man. He keeps saying it. And the, uh, so, uh, well, let's just say there were interesting calls. <laughs> so I did it for three months. And I call up MCI, and, I, and they were great. They, they got rid of all the ones that didn't do anything. I only got two calls that were actually aimed for me. And two calls out of three months. So I punted it. I did not have realize what a gold mine if I just kept it. You know, I could have made so much money selling it. So yes. I should have bought one nine hundred hookups. That would have made money, oh. but I didn't, didn't think about that. I think you're crossing a so line now, you know, Norm. Sorry, sorry, but anyway. So, but what what? The, your license plate on your truck, truck says, says hookups. Hook Does that yes. cause any problems or? Uh, no, no. Okay. People, people, because I mean, it's a big work truck, you know, white, you know, people go. So you, long story short, you started your own stereo the, speaker the, audio installation yes. business called yes. Hookups of Virginia. Right. Well, the. the and, <laughs> and. And. Yes, did, I'm embarrassed. Yes. Did you leave? Did you did you make enough with that to leave Circuit City? Yes. So what ended? So this up, was this was your main. Well, I did it for another decade, and the uh, I, I expanded to, to Richmond, Charlottesville, and Lynchburg, and I ended up managing um, anywhere from thirty to fifty jobs, and I was managing all these crews and stuff like that. But I was getting away from what I liked doing, which was working with people. And, and having them go, oh, I can do that, you know, click, whatever. And I was just managing people. And, and, I, and a couple of times I actually managed, I trained my own competition. And, and, I, and it was like, because they'd stop, go to business for themselves. But then they would call me when they get stuck. You know, so another way of saying it is, I'm the guy that installers call when they're stuck. Yeah. You know, okay. so, which works out pretty well. But the reason why I contacted it, well, it wasn't JR, it was uh, somebody else here. I was just getting burned out. And I had raised my rates to 125 an hour. And I did it for another year. And it, I thought, you know, this will make no difference. No difference at all. Hmm. And, and I was like, so I realized it wasn't about the money. I just, I, I really like making a difference with people. And I like having people go, aha, you know, and they can make stuff work and stuff like that. So one thing led to another. And, uh, Talked to Jr. and and I said, you know, they said, why do you want to leave? You're making. I said, it's not about the money. It's just not, you know. I'm just burned out, you know, managing people, managing blah blah blah. And at when I came back to Crutchfield, that there was 40 or 42 active jobs, and some of the jobs would be a day. Some of them would be like 18 months because it'd be a new house being built. You know, and break the foundation. Oh, blah, when, blah, you, blah. when you, you mean the day one when you started back at Crutchfield, you right. still had forty two customers. I still had, I still had forty two jobs, yeah. active jobs. So one thing led to another, but it took another almost two years to work through that backlog. And the uh, so I'd work here, and then go and then uh, do you know whatever else on weekends, and and I gradually you know weeded it on down. And I don't take new jobs. I still take care of old customers, stuff like that. But you know. I, I'm, I'm full. <laughs> so hookups of Virginia is hookups. no longer a thing. No, no longer a thing. I just do yeah. it for friends and family and stuff like that. So y'all know a lot more than you probably ever wanted to know. I, I thought we, I thought we were just going to hear the story. I had no idea about the phone number, Norm. I did not, <laughs> I did not know that was that was happening. Um, so yeah, that's it's true. That's fantastic. Uh, are we getting close? We have winners. Well, Yay! good. The crowd, the crowd wants to know. The people at home want to know who the winners are. You're going to send them to me here. You're going to send them to me here. You're going to send them to Landon. Uh, yeah, he'll be fine. He survived it last time. I've got. So I'm going to get a cannon here. Did you know I have yes, a get cannon? I've been warned. All right. Three times. Two winners.
Each winner gets a $2,000 shopping spree for Heos products on crutchfield.com. We will contact you. Your winners of this Heos sweepstakes are Daniel D. from Sierra Vista, Arizona, and Jennifer K. from Sharon, Pennsylvania. Yay! Woo! Ah! <laughs> That's awesome. Huh? Oh, good. Okay. Scherzer, my dog, was not too thrilled with that, but <laughs> he, he's all right. Uh, so once again, Daniel and Jennifer from uh, Arizona and Pennsylvania, congratulations. You are our winners. Well done. Thank you for playing. Thank you for watching Crutchfield Live. Norm, thank you for coming on the Crutchfield Live today and uh, having so much fun. This was, this was incredible. <laughs> The, thank you to everybody watching. That you, if you're still here, asking all these wonderful questions, we put Norm to the test. You put me to the test. You put our people here to the test. And I think we raised uh, we raised the bar of Crutchfield Live yes, today. I think this much went so. really, really well. Lots of great questions. Thank, thank you. you to everybody behind the scenes, running the cameras, looking at the comments, throwing in the links, helping me out. Philip for coming in and talking about this. Thank you to Landon, who has been a big key factor in making yes. Crutchfield Live so good this last year or so. Today happens to be his last day. We will be bummed to see him go. Somebody else will be at the controls in two weeks when we do Crutchfield Live again, uh, and I'm looking forward to that. Uh, we're going to have a good time with Mark from Car Audio Fabrication. Thank you for watching. On behalf of Norm, I'm JR, and everybody else here, thanks for watching. Have a great one. See you. Bye.